Greetings, friends. I'm Pastor Gabe with First Southern Baptist Church in Junction City, Kansas. Thanking you for watching this presentation of our Sunday morning service. What a wonderful blessing of God that in a time such as this, we're still able to enjoy some good teaching through these digital resources. There are some bad teachers out there you gotta watch out for, but a lot of good Bible teachers as well. And we thank you for selecting this service, and I pray that this teaching will be edifying to you. I'm currently going through the Sermon on the Mount, and the sermon today will be in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. We'll get started in just a moment. First, I wanna remind you that if you wanna to give to our ministry, you can do so through our website. Go to fsbcjc.org, click on Give in the menu options, and you can donate to our church that way. All of the proceeds go straight to our church and we are a nonprofit organization. Before we get to the sermon, let's have a time of singing. And we're gonna to begin today with the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Please remain standing in honor of the word of the king. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill 
cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. And I pray that you teach us through this today what it means to be salt of the earth. How are we the light of the world? But we are to be as Christ in this world. Teach us to walk as Jesus walked. Speak to us through your word this morning. And let us not be ashamed of the message of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. Help us to be comforted by these words. And so likewise, be a comfort to others who need to hear these words. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So these are very common terms that you've heard in Christendom. If you've been a Christian uh, for most of your life, if you grew up in church and in Sunday school, then you've heard these terms before, being the salt of the earth, being the light of the world. Even if you're a relatively new believer and you've only been a Christian for a short time, still you've probably uh, certainly heard these terms somewhere before, right? They're so commonly said to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. When I was a little kid and in one of the churches that we were involved in, they had a food pantry ministry that was called SALT, and that was an acronym, S-A-L-T. It stood for Salt and Light Today. So it was called SALT, but even that word SALT was, was part of the acronym. Anyway, but it was all about being the hands and feet of Christ to the earth, to take food that was collected in the food pantry and give it to those who were needy. And oftentimes when you hear these terms, that's the way you hear them described, as if we are to do something in order to be these things. I told you when we started our series in the Sermon on the Mount that this was the most famous sermon ever preached, and in being the most famous sermon, it's often misunderstood. Portions of it taken out of context, twisted, misapplied. Likewise, when we got to the Beatitudes, of course, being part of the Sermon on the Mount, those were often misunderstood as well. Oftentimes, the way that you hear the Beatitudes relayed are in some kind of a natural sense. Blessed are the poor, rather than understanding blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed are they who mourn, not understanding a a spiritual mourning or the grief that our sin would cause us or the desire for the righteousness of Christ. So just as the Beatitudes are twisted and misapplied and taken out of context, so this understanding of salt and light comes about the same way. Like I said, oftentimes, this is it, it, the application of this is in doing something. You have to be the salt of the earth. You have to become the salt of the earth. How is it that you become the salt of the earth? You have to become the light of the world. Well, how do you become that? But look at the verbs. You hear me say this all the time. Look at the verbs. And when my kids and I are doing Bible study together, I'll tell them, with my oldest two in particular, with their Bible open in front of them, I'll say, look at the verbs. Let's underline all the verbs. And my kids would get this right from the very beginning. The second word is a verb. You are the salt of the earth. Likewise, in verse 14, you are the light of the world. Remember when we were doing the Beatitudes, I quoted to you from Charles Spurgeon, who said that the Beatitudes are not about how to be saved. They describe the saved. Christians are poor in spirit. Christians are those who mourn. Christians are meek. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. They are merciful. They are pure in heart. They are peacemakers, and they're persecuted for righteousness' sake. This is describing the saved. So likewise, when we get to salt and light, we're still continuing in that. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Remember that again back in chapter 5, verse 1. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. Verse 2, and he taught them, saying, a disciple means learner. 
And Jesus is the teacher, and he's talking to those who are followers of him. The crowds are there, but who he's addressing and who he's describing are the ones who follow him. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Not do this and you will become the salt of the earth or the light of the world. You are. The study of being is a study that we uh, have labeled ontology. It is a study of what makes a person who they are. And oftentimes we, we talk about becoming someone that we want to be, right? And we'll even have this kind of existential crisis when we leave home and we go off to college and we're, we're looking for that person that we're to become. I don't want to be like my parents. I want to be my own person, my own man or my own woman. And so, uh, and so you go off to college and you try to find yourself whatever that's supposed to mean. There's another term that goes with that. It's sowing your wild oats. There's another term that goes with that, and it's depravity, right? <laughs> Just pursuing the passions and the lusts of your flesh. That's what you go to do, and you think that in indulging in all these desires that you have in your body, somewhere in that you're going to find who you are. It's chasing your tail. It's a dog chasing his tail. Who you end up with is who you started with when you began this journey, trying to find yourself in the sins and the lusts and the passions of your flesh. You started as a selfish, sinful person, and you finished up that journey as a sinful, selfish person. I did this when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Of course, it was when I went off to college. I thought I had to find myself, and that meant that I just chased after the passions of my flesh. And there is a way that seems right to a man, as it says in the book of Proverbs, but its end is the way of death, and that's the way it was for me. And God opened my eyes to that. I was doing the things that I wanted to do, and I thought that somehow in, in doing these things, I was going to find out who I really am, what my hopes and dreams are. I would even try to Christianize it and say, this is what God has destined for me, and justify these things that I was doing as if it was something godly, but it wasn't. It was sinful and selfish. It was depraved. It was rebelling against God. And I came to realize that if I continue in this course, I am going to fall under the judgment of God. And it was through the hearing of his word and realizing that I had broken his law and that what I deserved was his wrath, that my eyes were opened. And I fell before him weeping, and I asked for God's forgiveness that he might cleanse me of my sins and unrighteousness. I asked him to give me a new heart, no longer after the things that were all about me, but I wanted to be after the things that were all about God, serving him, worshiping Christ who died for me, who gave himself for me, that I could be forgiven my sins and adopted into the family of God. And the Lord answered my prayer and gave me a new heart and a new mind. And it took a little while to still get out of those selfish tendencies, and I'm still working on that as I am growing in sanctification and holiness in Christ. But it is no longer I who live for myself, but Christ who lives within me. It's what Paul said to the Galatians, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And this life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who forgave me of my sins, who loved me, and died for me. who I found myself, where, where I truly found myself, when I found out who I truly am supposed to be is when I found myself in Christ. Psalm 139 says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But you know what I did with that image of God that I've been made in? I took those things that God gave me, the body and the mind that the Lord gave to me to glorify him, and instead I glorified myself. And we've all done this. Before we've come to Christ, this is exactly who we are. Paul describes this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 
you were dead in your sins and your transgressions in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Before we come to Christ, we are sons of Satan. We are children of wrath. We deserve the judgment of God. But God, as that passage goes on to say in Ephesians 2.4, did not leave us dead in our sins, but he sent his son to die for us. By grace, you have been saved. In Christ, by faith in Jesus, you've gone from being a child of this fallen world, a child of the devil, to being a child of God, adopted into his family through faith in Jesus Christ, adopted by his blood. And now we've become fellow heirs of the kingdom of God. You were once a a treasonous criminal against God's kingdom. You had committed treason against the high throne of the king of the universe. What do you think you deserve for that? His judgment. His complete, your complete destruction when his kingdom comes upon you. That's all that's going to happen to you. But God in his mercy did not leave us dead in that state. He sent his son Jesus who laid down his life for us. He paid the price for the treason that we had committed against God. And by faith in Jesus, your sins are washed away. You have been atoned for. The price has been paid. God's wrath was poured out on Christ instead. And it's been satisfied. And now by the love of God, as demonstrated in his son, you have become his child, adopted into the family by faith in Jesus. Who you are now? is a child of God. And as a child of God, who you are is the salt of the earth. Who you are is the light of the world. This is ontology. It's who you are in Christ. You have become this. Christ has made you into this. You have been born, as it says in John chapter 1, not by the will of the flesh, but by the will of God, you've been born again. And so now as a follower of Jesus, as a child of God, you are the salt of the earth. This is not about things that you do to become this. Christ has made you this. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you're not becoming salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. So now, as far as the ontological argument goes, we have... Uh, come to an understanding of what it means to be salt of the earth or to be light of the world. It is your present state. It is not something that you become. So now let's talk about what these things actually mean. You are this, so what is it? What does it mean to be the salt of the earth? Now, Jerusalem was in a very salty area, or this is one of the mountains in Galilee, but okay, you're still getting the, the... the Holy Land picture here, right? So where this is in first century Judea and Samaria, this was a very salty region because they had the Dead Sea that was right there. And the Dead Sea is a very salty body of water. In fact, the saltiest enclosed body of water on planet Earth. It is so salty that you could lay down in it and you would float right there on the top. The, the, the buoyancy, because of the minerals that are in the water, you would just stay right there on the surface. I don't know if, if you've ever had swimming lessons and one of the first things they teach you when you're doing swimming lessons, they teach you that dead man's float or the, uh, well, not dead man's float because that's face down. It's a survivor's float. There you go. Before you die, you do the, <laughs> you do the survivor's float. So you're, you're out there kind of like in a starfish pattern or something laid out on the on the water. And I never could do that because my waist would, I couldn't get like my stomach up. It would always sink down. So no matter how hard I'm trying to keep my legs and my hands straight out and and floating on the surface of the water, my waist would just sink down and I would, I would just fall into the water. Never worked out for me, but apparently it's really easy to do this on the Dead Sea because it's so salty. 
So even back then, 2,000 years ago, here in first century uh, Holy Land, they would take water out of the Dead Sea in, in big basins, and then they would let it, they would set the basins out in the sun, these big dishes, big bowls, they would set it out in the sun, the sun would evaporate all the water, and then what's left is the salt that's inside. And so that salt would be used for two things. It would be used as a seasoning, and it would be used as a preservative. Now, as a seasoning, that's obvious. That's the way we use salt, right? You use salt, shake, uh, shake some salt on your food. It enlivens the flavor a little bit. You use salt in your cooking. As a preservative, we don't use it so much as a preservative, except, you know, in your canned goods. There's all kinds of preservatives in that. But the way that meat was preserved back in these days is in salt. They didn't have refrigeration. You didn't have like a deep freezer. You know, Dave goes out and he goes hunting and he uh, gets himself a deer and he gets it uh, put into ground meat and then he'll get those little rounds and he'll be dishing that out like for the next year or two. <laughs> the, the deer meat that, uh, that Dave just gave you was the deer he killed last year, right? So he's got a freezer to be able to preserve this stuff, and that's the way that we preserve our food. We got this pandemic that's going on right now, and so you're probably going out to the supermarket, and you're buying up food, uh, getting your meat, and you've got a deep freezer at home that you store it in for when you actually need it. You know, since we're all supposed to be quarantined, we're all supposed to be isolated, this is how we preserve food now, but it's not the way that they did it in Jerusalem. They didn't have refrigeration, didn't have a freezer that you could put it in. So you would pack the meat in salt, and the salt would preserve the meat, would preserve it from decaying, would preserve it from rotting. You know, it's interesting that if you note here, it says, if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, not as a seasoning, not as a preservative, except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. The salt, in serving as a preservative, keeps the meat from rotting. And that's the way this world is. It is fallen, it is depraved, it is perishing, it has been subjected to futility, is the description that we get in Romans chapter 8. And you see reminders of that all around. Just the fact that we've got a pandemic going on right now is a reminder that the earth has been subjected to futility. Famines, earthquakes, storms, the fact that you experience depression, sickness in your body, that people turn on you, that you get stabbed in the back, you get betrayed, uh, that, uh, that a person seems like they have to lie in order to get ahead in life, but you being an honest person, you can't seem to get ahead at all. All of these things are evidences of the fact that we live in a fallen world. Evil, depravity, temptation, your own sinfulness is an evidence of this, and most especially, death. Death is the number one example of how this world is fallen and perishing, because death is the consequence for our sin. So people die because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. So there are reminders all the time that this world is decaying, decaying and dying. And a person, remember I mentioned again, before we came to Christ, we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. A person is a walking corpse. As an unbeliever, they don't know Christ and they're perishing. Until they hear the gospel and repent and come to faith in Jesus, they continue to walk in, in, a, in a dead man's pace. So we, as the salt of the earth, are preserving this carcass from rotting. And eventually it is going to come to an end. Christ is going to return and he is going to judge this world. But we are preventing it from falling into worse depravity than it's already in. We as the church do that as we hold forth the gospel, as we follow the commands of God. God's presence is here, his Holy Spirit with us for all who believe in Jesus Christ. As a, as a seasoning, we even give the earth flavor. For there's no satisfaction to be found in the stuff of this world. None of it ever actually satisfies. You can get a little bit of pleasure out of it for a little bit of time. The stuff that you buy, the things that excite you, uh, the entertainment that you watch, whatever it might happen to be, you'll find some sort of a, a joy in those things, but, but it doesn't last. And even the stuff that you own is going out of date. 
It'll give you satisfaction for a little while, but eventually you need the new model in order to get the kind of high you got from the last model that you bought, right? And then that one's going to go out of date and you need the next one and the next one. These constant reminders that the stuff of this world is just never going to satisfy us. And we're always going to be looking for more. I remember when Albert Moeller was talking about uh, Mike Bloomberg, who was running for president. Of course, he's pulled out now, but uh, he's uh, something like the ninth richest man in the world or something like that. And he was talking about being on that Forbes list, being that high up. There's always that desire to be the next number up. You're the ninth richest man in the world. You want to be number eight. And when you're the eighth richest man, you want to be number seven. And whatever company you own, the higher you, uh, higher up you go on the Forbes list, the better it looks for your company. People invest in that company and you make more money. So you're never satisfied with your position. You always have to have the next one. Even this man who has, I mean, he's literally a billionaire, still wants more and can't be satisfied until he gets more. If, if even billionaires in this world show us that they can't be satisfied with their billions, I mean, what hope is there for the rest of us who are still clamoring after stuff in order to give us our joy? So none of the world gives us any lasting flavor, any any goodness doesn't last. None of it is, is any good at all. In fact, when we come to taste and see how the Lord is good, as it says in the Psalms, then we find out just how bitter all the stuff in the world really was, that none of that stuff really could satisfy us anyway. Once you taste Christ, nothing else compares. And so we give that, that seasoning, that flavor to the earth, that a person comes to find Christ through the message of the gospel that we have been commissioned to go out and share as the children of God in this world, as lights of the world. As we go out with this message of the gospel, we share the sweetness of Christ, being as he is, sharing his word with others. And people taste that goodness and mmm. They come to find, boy, the rest of this world, this was gross. I was eating rotten food. I was making myself sick on this stuff. It could have killed me. And then I didn't know there was anything better than this until you showed me Christ. And in this way, we are the salt of the earth. We preserve. We season. And if we lose that saltiness, how can the saltiness be restored? It can't be. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, there are some skeptics that will criticize Jesus for this particular remark because they will say salt can't lose its saltiness, so therefore Jesus was wrong. I mean, it just demonstrates that he really wasn't the Son of God because he just didn't know enough about salt to realize that salt can't lose its saltiness. Well, first of all, the kind of salt that they had in this particular day and age, I mean, we're talking 2,000 years ago, and the kind of salt that you would get out of the Dead Sea, this isn't the good, refined kind of salt that we enjoy today. So it was very easy for this salt to lose its saltiness. You had to have greater amounts of it, more concentration of it, to get to the, the level of saltiness that you have even in your own table salt. So this isn't the same kind of salt. And yes, it can lose its saltiness. But even our salt that we use today, whether you're talking about rock salt that you're going to sprinkle on the sidewalk, or salt that you're going to use to season your food. Though it has been refined, it's still not pure. It's still not perfect salt. And even that salt can, over time, lose its saltiness. I remember reading a story of a guy down around the Hutchinson area who had bought up some barns, some big bins that he was going to put salt in. Because you have the salt mines down in that area. And he was selling that salt to the local farmers. Well, he noticed something that as in those bins, he was getting further and further down to the bottom of that salt. He never actually covered the floor of his barns and his bins with anything. It was just the dirt floor. So when he got down to the bottom of that salt, the salt that was closest to the ground was no good. It wasn't even salty anymore. Whether it was the moisture that had come up from the ground or getting mixed in with the dirt, whatever it was, he could even pick it up and put it in his mouth. It just tasted like dirt. It did not taste like salt at all. Though he could see the salt crystals, he could taste no saltiness in it. And he discovered the closer to the earth the salt is, the more likely it is to lose its saltiness. So see, when you become worldly, 
when you behave just like the rest of the world, when you think that you can chase after the passions of your flesh, you can still have those fleshly desires and not live in a holy way after Christ. Then you become just like the world, and the world is looking at you, and they're thinking, you've got nothing to offer us. You're just like us. So there's, there's nothing unique. There's nothing flavorful. There's nothing preserving. You're no good. You're just like the earth, so you may as well be tossed out into the earth and trampled upon. You will be judged like the rest of this world. We are told in 1 John chapter 1 that if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But that verse goes on, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sins. If you walk in darkness, you're not walking in Christ. You're just demonstrating that you're actually not a follower of Jesus. But if you walk in holiness as Jesus walked, then you demonstrate that you are his follower and you have fellowship with his people and the blood of Christ has cleansed you from all sins. That you don't walk in sinfulness anymore. You walk in the righteousness of God. If you go back to walking in the ways of this world, you may as well just be tossed out and trampled with the rest of the dirt. So that is the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Let's look at the next picture that Jesus gives here. And I just mentioned this a little bit in looking at 1 John chapter 1. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I was listening to John MacArthur uh, uh, exegete this particular passage, because that's what he does. John MacArthur exegetes. He exposits. So he was talking about this particular passage and, uh, and was saying that he went over into the Holy Land and he stood in the valley and he just noticed just towns on hilltops. There's the, the, the town over there is on a hill. That one over there is on a hill. That one is on a hill. The cities are always high up. So no matter where you are, you can see the city. Now, of course, they were positioned that way so that they would be most protected. You can see the enemy coming from a distance when you're high up. But it also becomes like a light, like a beacon for somebody who's traveling in darkness. Where is the town? You just look right there. The light can be seen from everywhere. You are a city set on a hill. It cannot be hidden no matter where you are. You see the town set up there on a hill, shining a light, guiding you the way home. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. This is literally peck. It was a a unit of measurement, a, a great big basket for measurement. So no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. That would be absurd. But they put it on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now, when I read this, where my mind went right away, A lamp on a stand. I went to Revelation chapter 1, where Jesus is described as standing among the seven golden lampstands. And the lampstands represent the churches that Jesus writes to, or that Jesus addresses in chapters 2 and 3. Now, to some of those churches, he says, If you don't repent of your sinful ways and return to me, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. If they don't repent, he says, I will remove your lampstand because they're no longer shining the light of Christ to the world. They become like the world. So if we have the light of Christ, we're going to put it on a stand. We're going to shine the light of the gospel, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the house. And and this is the house of God. The church that is being built up, as Peter describes it in 1 Peter chapter 2. So all who are in the house, glory in the light of Christ that shines upon all. And we are to hold out this light to the world so that they may see God through the light of Christ. In the same way, verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, oftentimes we take, let your light shine before others, and we apply that to good works, and so we say that the light is the good works. But these are two different things. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Your light and the good works are two different things. The light is not good works. The light is Christ. 
right? John 1, 9, he is the true light who has come into the world. John 3, 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. But those who love the light came into the light so that it might be seen that their deeds have been carried out in God. That sounds, well, that sounds just like what we're reading here in Matthew 5, 16, does it not? John 9, 5, Jesus said to his disciples, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, where is Jesus now? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. So who is the light of the world? You are. But you're not the source. You are not the source of this light. You reflect this light. So you're like what the moon is to the sun. The moon is not a source of light. It's merely reflecting the light of the sun. Jesus is the sun. You are like the moon. So we, to this world, reflect the light of Christ. When we walk as Jesus walked, when we follow him, when we share his gospel, when we are as Christ, when we are Christ-like, pursuing holiness and the righteousness of Christ, we are that light shining in a dark place, shining before others, so that when they see your good works, the righteous deeds that we do, because we are imitating Christ, they will give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Consider in 1 Peter uh, uh, chapter 2, this was... Uh, a section that we were in in our adult Sunday school class just a few weeks ago, 1 Peter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, among the pagans, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The Apostle Paul to the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. What is the conduct of the people in this world? You look all around you. I mean, just with the news that's going on right now, you turn it on. All you hear is complaining and people looking for somebody to blame. Somebody is to blame for coronavirus. No one's to blame for this. It's a, it's a virus. It's a sickness. People are going to get infected. They're going to get sick because that's what happens. When diseases and pandemics spread, it's happened in the history of the world. It's happening even in the present day. Do you look at uh, some of the philosophies that are overtaking us right now, overtaking the culture, even overtaking the church, even within our own Southern Baptist denomination, critical race theory and intersectionality, social justice philosophies. These things are built upon blaming others, causing division separating people out into various different groups and deciding who has privilege and who doesn't. These things divide us. The world is all about grumbling and complaining, and we are not to be that way. The rest of the world will give you a license to complain. They're all complaining. They want you to do it too, but that's not the way we are to be. We are to be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom we shine as lights. When the world would be perfectly fine about you complaining about your circumstances, what that actually communicates when you complain about your situation is that you don't believe that God is sovereign. You don't believe that he is in control. But when you don't complain about your circumstances, when you understand Romans 8.28 that God is working all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. When you rejoice in the midst of your circumstances, you look otherworldly. And then people are going to ask you for something that, that Peter addresses in 1 Peter 3.15, an answer for the hope that lies within you. They're going to ask you for that. What is this thing that you've got? 
When was the last time somebody asked you for an answer for the hope that lies within you? Do you look like the rest of the world? Do you sound like them in your speech? Or do you look otherworldly? Are you speaking words that are honoring of your king who sits enthroned? You're speaking kingdom language, not not worldly language. You're pointing people to another destination, not anything in this world which ultimately cannot give us hope, cannot satisfy, and cannot save. Nothing in this world can. Only Jesus can. And when we shine a light, whom we're shining that light on is Christ. When we are the salt of the earth, whom we are showing to people is Jesus. Consider consider the context of these things that we have read here. We don't just get to Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16 in a vacuum. Last week, we were looking at the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Who are we talking about there? Now, absolutely, I quoted to you from Charles Spurgeon, who said that the Beatitudes are not describing how to be saved. They describe the saved. But it's even higher than that. Who are we describing here? Jesus. Jesus was poor in spirit. Jesus mourned. Jesus was meek. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness. He's merciful. He was pure in heart. He's a peacemaker. And he was persecuted for righteousness' sake. And so when we are the salt of the earth, When we are the light of the world, we're being as Christ in this world. All of this, again, is to the glory of God. Look at it again. So that others may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Not glory to you for your works, that they may look at Christ. Is everything that you are about Jesus Are you trying to point people to Christ, or are you trying to get people to look at you? Are you trying to satisfy your flesh, or do you know that your only satisfaction is in Christ? Do you know who you are? Are you trying to find yourself in sinfulness and wretched depravity, or do you know that you can only be found in Christ, who you were made to be, was a worshiper of God, who you become is a worshiper of God when you become a follower of Jesus, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then you can't help but to be salt of the earth, the light of the world, because that, my friends, is the description of a Christian. Jesus is the greatest, most wonderful fragrance, flavor, good thing that we can partake in. His body broken for our sins, his blood spilled for the forgiveness of our sins that we even receive when we come to the Lord's table. He being the light of the world that shines in a dark place so that we might recognize our sin and need for a Savior and look and see that Jesus is that Savior. Are you showing that to others? by your very life, because it is in your nature as a Christian to be the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. John 12, 46, Jesus said, I have come as light into the world so that whoever believes in me will not remain in darkness. Walk in darkness no more. Walk in the light of Christ.